Hello and welcome to today's video. So this time we're going to be speaking to Andy Mark Thompson. Now Andy produces these fantastic, uh, predominantly Photoshop Doctor Who designs with Colt TV as well and they are absolutely amazing. So uh, I'm delighted to be able to interview Andy today. So Andy, when did you become a fan of Doctor Who and Colt TV in general? Well, I think it all sort of um, dates back to uh, 1971. Um, the first uh, the first Doctor Who I ever saw complete was Terror of the Autons, um, the first one with the Master. And it actually stuck with me um, for quite some time after it. It, it. it scared the living daylights out of me. I, I, I was probably about six or seven at the time. And probably not uh, not amongst the target audience i think doctor who was aimed at a more um, adult or a more older audience back then um yeah. but one of the things i it's, it's still with me is that is, is the scene of the doctor ripping a policeman's face off oh, which yes. was so bloodless <laughs> <laughs> and it revealed it to be an auton it's not exactly the sort of thing you show a six or seven year old but i remember all of the um all of all of the cliffhangers from it, and they, they always stop with me. The, the Joe struggling with the ammunition box, and the aforementioned uh, police unmasking, and uh, the, the quite terrifying bit where the doctor's attacked by his telephone flex. But that that that's the thing that sort of probably started it. That was the genesis of it. But I don't think it was until the demons. At the end of that season, that I, I actually started watching it on a, on a probably regular basis. The, the, the problem at the time in seventy one was the fact that ITV scheduled UFO up against Doctor Who. Oh, so I, my my my, uh, my loyalties were divided. By the time the Demon started, UFO had finished, and what better story than the Demons to sort of start it off? And since the Demons, right through until survival i never missed an episode wow yeah um which, which is, is pretty good no i tell a lie i missed one episode and it was death to the daleks part one and i missed it because i went to the cinema ah, right. we had a we had a, a, a family out and go to the cinema right now i remember missing doctor who because i'm going to the cinema do i remember the film that we went to see i don't no. <laughs> it probably says a lot about my, my liking of Doctor Who. On the back of your love of Doctor Who, is this how you took your first steps and got involved with early Doctor Who fandom? Not not so much. Well, it depends what you, your interpretation of early is. I didn't join the Dwarves until about 80, 81. Of course, the Dwarves were established and had been going for a few years by then. I, 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 can't, I think about 76, 75, 76, wasn't it? Yeah, Billy yeah. Hinchcliffe's time on the Doctor. So he, he talks about the Dwarves. I remember um, when they changed the TARDIS console room um, to that uh, Jules Verne type one. Um, there was a mention of the fact that it had it, it's a brand new console, room, but you know it, it's okay because the Doctor Who Appreciation Society have had a look at it and they've said it's okay. <laughs> there was right. a press release, you know, those press stories, you know. Yeah. Allay everyone's fears that they've changed it, you know. So, so yeah. they, the, the BBC seemed to hold in esteem the fact that um, they'd got a doc, an appreciation society for one of their programmes and yeah. consulted it on major things. <laughs> That's the impression I got. But as I say, I didn't really join it until sort of 1980, 81. And did you start going to the the, the conventions that they organised back then? Oh gosh, yeah. There, there was a there was a few. Um, I remember going to. The Dwas Social and the Blackpool weekends that um, I think it was David J. Howe organised. Yeah. Um, I say this is early eighties. This is, yeah. um, and I, I say I, I, I count myself really lucky to have seen and met, you know, some uh, some Doctor Who celebrities, Doctor Who, sort of, you know, oh, they're, they're legends now. Legends now, yeah. Who are no longer with us, like yeah. Michael Craze and Jack, Jacqueline Hill. So did you start a Doctor Who local group and were you involved in some early fanzines as well? Yeah, me and a mate, we, we, we sort of formed the Derby local group. I, I live in Derby, I've always lived in Derby. I've never moved from Derby. 
we started the Doctor Who local group. It's a problem. In fact, I can tell you the exact date. Well, I can't tell you the exact date. I can tell you what was happening on the exact date of the first meeting. It was the the marriage of of Lady Diana and uh, Prince Charles. Being um, older teenagers, Hmm. uh, it it didn't tend something like that didn't uh, didn't sort of move us. No, there was about there was only about four or five of us. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, we sat around and played the Doctor Who uh, that new that Doctor Who board game that came out, the one from Games Workshop. Oh, yeah, the the role playing playing that. And work well. So no, no. T- I tell you, we sat down, work trying to work out how to play that, mm. and then it sort of blossomed from there. We, we we had sort of regular monthly meetings. Yeah. Occasionally, we we invited guests up to them, um, ones who would just accept <laughs> accept yeah. expenses. Yeah. We had Michael Wisher at the first one. Michael Wisher. We had um, Peter Miles. Mm. He put us in touch with Peter Miles, and Peter Miles brought along his friend. Um, I forget the actress's name. No, Cynthia Grenville, yeah. who played um, the leader of the Sisterhood of Khan. Oh, the okay. Brain of Morbius. He brought her along. <laughs> it was it was a lovely. Um, alcohol was imbibed at that meeting. And you're still involved in local conventions today, aren't you? Oh yeah, on and off. I, I'm, I'm co-organizer of the Hooverville convention, yeah. which uh, occurs in Derby usually on the weekend after the summer bank holiday. I think I first came across your work on Twitter where some of my friends have reposted some of your classic Doctor Who Target book covers and I'm a big well, a big collector of those myself and also vintage paperbacks and that's I think where I first sort of saw your work online. Yeah, I've still got my set of, <laughs> of first editions because I started collecting them on... In 1976. So jumping ahead a bit, when did you start sort of honing your skills and using Photoshop to start creating these, well, amazing recreated jackets? That was quite late on, to be honest. I, I'd done a couple of fanzines, <clears throat> I contributed to a few fanzines back in the 80s and 90s. Um, but I, I never did anything visual. I found myself moving towards graphic design. Not, not, artistic graphic design but things like you know doing advertising and designing you know posters and stuff like that yeah and i ended up doing that and in the end my final year i, I my, my portfolio got me a, an a plus really pleased with and it, that was the first that that portfolio was the first inkling that of, of what i was going to sort of do eventually yeah in my spare time, I suppose. But what I did with that was to create a television series. I'd, I'd done it back in when I started it on the course. I, I, I'd actually created a television series. It was actually an update of Department S. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. And I, 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 I did. I mm-hmm. it out. I did what you're supposed to do. Come up with so many storylines quickly, mm. characters, and how it, how it it and everything and I had that line around I didn't end up using it in any of my university courses and what I did with that I then took that concept and turned it into a press pack designed a, a magazine cover did sort of branding for it and everything that you know I, I even photographed friends to be the, the lead characters in it yeah you know, and it, it and that and I created uh, this magazine which had a retro feel to it. And it got me an A plus. And fast forward, finishing the course, I ended up, you know, I've got Photoshop. I had, I had a really ancient copy of Photoshop on the computer, and I, I started using it after that, yeah. this would be 2010, starting to, you know, do little fiddly bits and pieces in it. And I started doing these these target covers for the the new series. Yeah, yeah. Started off. The first one I did was for Rose. Then I did one for, you know, another story. And, and I thought, hold on, why don't I do them all? Mm. You know, it would be something to do, you know. And I ended up doing all of the um, Target book covers for just about every new series episode. And when I'd done that, I thought, well, why don't I just go back and do the the original series ones, but do them in – I did the, the new series ones in a more 
um, going back to the original branding, you know, that block Doctor Who logo that was on the yeah. early Target books. And I, did, I, I just started doing them in that, and I did all the Hartle and Troughton ones right up into uh, up until um, the per Pertwee one started. And I'll be honest, a lot of them are pretty crude. Some people like them. Mm -hmm. um, not, a great, not a great many. It wasn't a huge success. You know, oh, wow, he's done all these. And then, then I, I ended up doing variations for each doctor. Like for the Pertwee ones, I did sort of, I made them a bit look a bit more retro rather than using the logos that were there and the, the Tom Baker ones. And for the Sylvester McCoy ones, I was getting a bit more cocky. And I, I redesigned a, a, a pound, what I called the Poundland logo. You know, they, they can't afford the rights to the, 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 the logo, right, because it's a separate, a separate license. And so they, they have to create their own logo to put on it. And, that, and I, I created this, this dreadful, cheap-looking logo, which I wouldn't have done. I, I did it as a joke. This is the thing. I have to put sort of, you know, silly things on it. One, one of the things I set myself with, the, the, the target books that I did, don't put the Daleks on the cover. So I never put Daleks on the cover. I did one or two I did, but I, mm. I thought that, that would be an interesting, um, not sort of a, a bit of a joke, a bit of an in-joke, because, you know, the Daleks are expensive. Yeah. Uh, expensive monster to, to use. But I thought it'd be fun just not to put, but nobody ever noticed that. I did covers for the Dead Planet, for the, um, the Dalek Invasion of Earth, Dalek Master Plan, those stories and everything, right? Mm. If you look, go back and look, there's no Daleks on them. Of course, it's not just the Target books. I mean, you've done so many other things, uh, such as the annuals, for example. Yeah, I mean, this, this it, it stems from, you know, it, it, there's, there's a mixture of nostalgia and a love of retro designs. Mm. You know, there, 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 there was a lot more freedom. The designers had quite a bit more freedom. They probably didn't realise it at the time. But they seem to have a bit more freedom back in the 50s, 60s, 70s hmm. um, to actually, you know, do different things. You take a look at the the Radio Times covers for Do yeah. Doctor Who got during the 70s, the, the Pertwee ones. And look at how different they all are. They're not just, um, you know, big photo. No, no, it's pretty if you look at the Terror of the Autons one, it's it's been laid out like a comic strip. And then the, that Frank Bellamy one, Mm. It's stunning. Yeah. I mean, that, that Frank Bellamy one it inspired the Target book, the early Target book covers. Uh, yeah, I, they are. I think some people appreciate the fact that that poor old Chris Achilleos was bought in because they couldn't get Frank Bellamy and they told him to do a Frank Bellamy cover. Oh, really? really? His, his artistic style isn't, isn't really Frank Bellamy. <laughs> He's right. doing another artist's style to create you know, that stippled dot. Yeah. with little bits of comic strip around it and the flying mm. bits. It's all there on his Radio Times, on, on Frank Bellamy's Radio Times cover. You've pretty much recreated Jody versions of almost all the classic Radio Times covers. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that, that's a fun thing to do. Uh, I, that, that was a, a little idea I had of putting Jody Whittaker onto all the Radio Times covers just yeah. to upset the Not My Doctor fans. <laughs> <laughs> um and it, it, yeah, I, I didn't do it just because of that. But there was an artistic reason for it. So as well of all the books and magazines and that, you do also do like vintage memorabilia as well, don't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's just the, the silliness of some of the memorabilia, uh, which, 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 which amuses me, the things that we had back in the 60s. I mean, I, I'd say we had. I, I, I was far too young to have these things yeah. in the 60s. Something like that... Um, Oh, what was it? The anti-Dalek fluid neutralizer. Yeah, that was available, which was a water pistol that had previously been a Steve Zodiac anti-fluid yeah. neutralizer. I mean, I did one of those and, and turned it into a Julia Bravo one. You know, yeah. uh, it, it's nice taking the, the those designs, hmm. recreating them with with obscure things. It, it's one of those. It, it stems down to the sort of humour I like. Will take two disparate subjects and bond them together such as the sea devil ice lollies a sea devil ice lolly <laughs> yeah. a, a savory sea devil ice lolly, <laughs> right you've got you can't just say do a sea devil ice lolly 
you've got to do something to twist it because you've already you've already done the sapphire and steel ice lolly. You've already done these lollies. You've got to do something different each time. You can't just bolt something onto it. Well, when I get replies to tweets um, saying, oh, do this, oh, do that, invariably it's basically tell the same joke. And I, I, I don't like... Um, I don't like repeating myself too much, although some people probably say I do too many annuals. <laughs> I, One that caught my eye recently was the Palatoy Brigadier Action Man. I thought that was fantastic. I mean, that, 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 I mean things like that are, are obvious. Mm. There's also a desire of things we didn't have back mm. in the 60s and 70s that um, we wish we had. We, 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 I have... Um, I have a strong desire that a lot of fans moan about not having things. Why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do a such and such? Right. And my, my attitude is, well, go and do it yourself now. You've got the facilities to do it in Photoshop, or you've got the f- facilities to make your own TARDIS console for your figures. Yeah. You know, p- people are doing that nowadays to a certain degree. So when I look at your designs, I think I recognize that. I've seen that image on an annual or I've seen that image on a comic or a magazine or a book jacket I mean in a lot of cases do you actually own the originals of these that you base your designs on or do you just sort of jump online and and grab the images from there a lot of them I I, I do own quite a few bits and bobs I mean if you've been in fandom and and collecting so long you probably have quite a bit of it I would think yeah I'm a bit ephemeral with my collection I mean stuff I will get rid of it if I get if if I realize it's been lying on the shelf gathering dust right I tend to get rid of things I I tend to keep the things I I I really like my valent omnibus you can probably see that yeah I can yeah Uh, (laughs) which has the the legend on it invoice presented by Terry Nation (laughs) instead of presented by Terranish. But it's doing things like that. Mm. Not, you know, covers, not thinking about what was actually going to be inside them, but um, just just making them, you know, a little bit absurd. I love doing Chumbly. I mean, for heaven's sake, I mean, they, 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 were, they were so obviously a, a reaction to the Daleks. Let's, let's do, you know, a, another little robot thing that you could actually produce. And, and the Chumbly, you could actually produce it as a neat little toy. Absolutely. Right. You know, which goes up and down and moves around. Yeah. Ball bearings or something. <laughs> it, it never was. And and if that had happened, you would have got all these chumbly books and chumbly mm. chumbly outer space book. And so so it, it, it's as much a, it's as much nostalgia as desire to have these things. I'm a huge fan of John Wyndham's Day of the Triffids. In fact, I rank it as one of my all-time favourite books, and I very much enjoy the early 80s John Dottine BBC adaption of it. Now, that was recently released on Blu-ray, and I see you did your own cover for it, which I thought was massively superior to the one that ended up getting released. I shouldn't really say this, because it's probably been critical of other artists. One of the... um reasons for doing things is reactions to the things I don't like. So that, that's what I did with um, with the day, of, the day of the Triffids. I, I wasn't too keen on the cover. It was the colours I didn't like. Mm. I, 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 I thought they'd gone for a retro sort of look, similar to the, the style that was the, the, the really nice Quatermass and the Pit. Oh, yeah. That yeah. was a lovely cover. I love the colours on that. But the colours on the... Um, the day of the Triffids one is yellow and orange, and mm. yes, it's the colours of the Triffids, but um, it just didn't didn't gel with me. So I did something similar, and I, I did it as a sort of homage to that famous Radio Times cover. There's uh, a terrific yeah. photograph of John Dottine and Emma Ralph. It certainly made me think that you must have been approached by now to do professional Blu-ray or book jackets by now. Oh yeah, I've done I, I do I've I've done a, a few in over the years. The first the first major one I got was um, to do the cover for the reprint of Andy Murray's um, Quatermass, a uh, Nigel Neal biography mm-hmm. into the unknown. Um, he'd seen some covers on my blog that I'd done many years ago. Just just Quatermass novels. I, I love Quatermass. Yeah, I love the original TV shows, and I, I basically it was. If I remember right, it was an experiment to see if I could colorize black and white photos and, and, and make designs based around them. Yeah. I, I, I sort of found myself. I mean, I, I don't. I can't colorize photographs. I, I tint them slightly here and there. Hmm. Right. 
and then use them in artwork. I don't, you know, I'm nothing like Clayton Hickman. But those uh, they're uh, fantastic. Yeah. Pictures that those colorized photographs that he, he puts on Twitter occasionally are absolutely stunning. Yeah. Um, but this is what I, I did with the Quatermass ones. And if, if you look at the, they're on the blog, and I did them as if they were Penguin 1970s. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, David J. House saw my target books and decided um, I could do the he's doing the Telos books are publishing novelizations of their of real times dramas demons of devil's end was released as a, as a target paperback and i ended up doing the cover for that and it sold phenomenally well it's it's actually sold out now that edition you can still buy the book but not in that edition yeah and david's made it a sort of a regular thing that if they do novelizations of real time he'll do small print runs of them in target editions the nice little thing that D David loves them. Mm. Or, 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 well, David's a big expert on target books. It's <laughs> quite an honour to um, have someone like that appreciate your work. Now, you've also had your work featured in SFX magazine as well, haven't you? Yeah, it, it, it's in there regular. Mm. Um, I, I, I end up doing this sort of thing called retroactive. It, it's not taxing. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's trying to come up with something different every month. Um, that isn't Doctor Who. It's yeah. not that I've said I won't do Doctor Who for it. It's just I, I've set myself the task of not doing Doctor Who for the simple reason it needs it needs a bit more variety. And then mm. once I've done a Doctor Who one for that, I can't do another one. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I've done things like uh, you know, it, it's it's the the, the the brief is to do um, toys and merchandise that wasn't available that should have been available. Um, I did a fantastic journey board game, a, a Tomorrow People jaunting belt, Champion the Space Wonder Horse annual. Oh, that was the, the one I was really pleased with, was the Torchy the Battery Boy. Yeah. What I did for that was, it, it's, it's, a, it's a common thing, it's a common held thing that Torchy the Battery Boy is probably one of the most frightening things that Jerry Anderson ever made. Hmm. It, it's quite disturbing in a chucky sort of way. Yeah. So I, I, what I did, I did a, a video box sleeve designed like it's one of those um, American, cheap American um, rental store boxes um, of a compilation of episodes, but they've edited it together and made it into a horror film. It could actually be printed out onto card and made into a box that one. My only issue with that is that there's, I'm, I'm limited with the amount of space I've got in the magazine, and yeah. they have to put the, the 3D version of the box on there. i would even I'd actually done the back of it and put um, a listing and everything on it, and there were lots of little sort of in jokes and things on there. One of the things I really really enjoy are your sort of cinema movie style quad posters, and these seem so complicated with the the actual process of sort of recreating the poster, moving in the correct images, trying to get the correct fonts i mean these just seem so so complicated i mean are these the most complicated things that you actually put together i don't think so not not the not the the, cine, the, the recent cinema post i did i started doing them it, it was when lockdown started back in yeah. uh, march was it emily cook from um, the doctor who magazine started doing those tweet along she did they did rose to start with it wasn't it or was it there yes. the, no it was there the doctor to start with but Rose was the first really big one mm. or something. And I, I just did it. I thought I'll do a cinema poster of Rose. And that can be my contribution. And I'll tweet that. People liked it. It's uh, it, That one was based on, there's a couple that I, I did, which, which aren't based on any posters. I did that one. And it got, and I, I basically, then she announced another story. I thought I'll do another one. And basically, that, that became my little hobby during lockdown, mm. to do a poster for each of the tweet alongs, unofficially. I didn't approach her. The only thing I did, I, I did say to her, I did send her an email and said, you know, if you want anything doing, let me know. Yeah. I ended up, ah, that was it. I ended up doing the um, passport photos for all the doctors for that um, doctors assemble. No, uh, it was it was like a, a giant Zoom call for all the doctors, and they all had to have their profile picture. And she asked me to do all the profile pictures for the doctors, so I had pictures of you know. The sort of things the doctor would put on his Facebook profile as his photo. One sort of um, Tom Baker with the, the Mona Lisa. 
there was a nice picture of John Pertwee with his eyes a bit too large. And the one that started it off was the, the, the picture of... Um, there's a lovely photo of William Hartnell on the set of um, The Web Planet, where he's got his eyes closed. He looks as if he's fallen asleep. Virtually all your work is available on places such as Redbubble. Is that right? Somebody mentioned it to me. Hmm. Said, oh, you can put, why don't you put some of your stuff on Redbubble? I said, oh, yeah, all right, then. I don't, I don't try to, I only push it when there's an offer on, to be honest. I feel guilty about some of the prices they charge for things. Yeah, but, but I spend, I, I yeah. get 20% cut of the, that price. It's amazing to see what some of your designs have been used for, such as uh, the Tom Baker face mask, for example. Oh, that, that, that was just, that, that, that was it, that was put up as a joke. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I, I, I honestly didn't think people would buy the stuff, buy it, but it's actually, it, it People did. I ended up selling. Once I put it up, I sold about five or six. Weren't those from the old Doctor Who underpants? Yeah. So there's um there was a thing online about the about masks. You could make ma- You could make an effective mask from a pair of male underpants. <laughs> and somebody said somebody said online. I don't know who it was. You know, as long as it's not the Doctor Who underpants. And I just thought, hmm, I've got a decent scan of that artwork. Yeah. I'll just stick it on there because it, it's not my artwork. I no. had to reformat it to make it, you know, look a bit more fit yeah, on the yeah. What's it? But um, I just stuck it up there right, as a joke, putting the, the the thing, not thinking. Well, a bit of me thought people would buy it, right? But people, pe- the people who didn't buy it, would at least find it funny. No, it, it, it it's. It, I've sold a few of those. I've asked, you know, I. I, I once that I, I was aware of that, I, I did a few more designs for masks and things. Mm. Well, Andrew, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm sure I've got a lot of Doctor Who fans on this channel, and uh, I think they'll be as equally fascinated as I was with your designs. Thanks very much. Yep. Yeah, okay.